Hello. Um, I'm a games journalist for film, games, etc., and um, I'm here today with the soundtrack composer, audio lead, and audio designer on the Solus project. Um, so, yeah, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Hi there. Uh, I'm Jonas Kjellberg. I'm uh, pushing 30 in Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, making a living doing uh, indie game music and sound, basically. Cool. OK. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking if we if we just start at the beginning. So how, because I've taken a look at your portfolio on the website, how exactly did you come to work in sound for games and for films, for short films? So basically, um, I'm going to do like the, the long version, but very okay. short, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when I was in uh, high school, I started like doing uh, recordings on my own. I mm -hmm. thought that was... Uh, like a very fun thing to do and uh, then I wanted to pursue like a career in in studio uh, production so uh, I moved to Australia and I studied audio engineering okay. and whilst I was doing that I also started doing uh, music for short films because my friend was studying uh, film directing mm -hmm. and I thought it was uh, a lot of fun to compose and uh, I figured like I don't want to work in a as a studio producer. I wanna I wanna do compositions yep. and stuff. Yeah. So uh, after I came back uh, home to Sweden, I started uh, like uh, applying for uh, compositional educations. Mm -hmm. uh, and since I have no formal training in music before that, I, I had to like read up on a bunch of things. And I managed to get into uh, the R Royal Academy of Music in Stockholm uh, on a profile called Electroacoustic Composition, uh -huh. which is basically like art music, but electronic. So a lot of synthesizers, uh, programming, stuff like that, doing installations and uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, during my studies, I started thinking about like what do I want to do when I graduate and uh, I've always been into games obviously and um, I found this indie game that looked really cool uh, called Unmechanical and they were showing it on a uh, expo in Stockholm mm -hmm. so I went to see them and uh, basically uh, sold myself uh, as the perfect fit for them and it worked out really well and uh, with that soundtrack, I managed to then um, leap into some other projects, basically. OK, cool. Um, yeah. So you said you kind of approached the developers of a mechanical yourself. Is yeah. that the same process you took for the Solus project? Or did they come to you at that point? Or Well, um, most because I'm doing a bunch of projects at the same time. And most of them I have uh, found like through Reddit and stuff. And mm -hmm. I've approached them in a similar fashion. But uh, with the Solus product, it was a bit different. Okay. Because um, Shard, who is the main developer of the Solus project, he is uh, also a teacher at a gaming, um, or rather game development yeah. uh, school in Stockholm. And his students were making Unmechanical. So I kind of knew Shard from before. It's kind of a contact. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I spoke to him about doing sound and music for Solus many years ago when he just had started it. But uh, it wasn't the right time for that. And sort of just uh, uh, we, we lost touch, basically. And yep. then uh, just by coincidence, we met at a local game jam. And we started talking about it again. Cool. Uh, so and then it was timed perfectly. So yep. it was a good fit. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I looking at your portfolio, which looked really good, your your music looked really cool, the, uh, the samples you had on SoundCloud. So um, I saw that you've been composing music for both games and short films. Um, could you speak a bit about the differences between composing music for them to um, mediums? Because obviously games are a lot less scripted while short films are, you know, spot on. So how does that player interactivity um, affect your workflow? So player interactivity both makes it easier and harder, you okay. could say. Because um, with film, you need to always uh, think about the linearity, and it needs to 
fit perfectly with what happens on on screen uh, and um, sometimes you have to do quite awkward musical decisions just to shoehorn a thing into the short amount of time you have mm -hmm. for a certain film scene whereas in um, game music you don't have to do that as much yeah but at the same time game music is harder because you have to you want to um, communicate a feeling but you're not sure if the music will fit at that exact moment okay. because you don't know what the player is doing yeah so uh, for instance in the solos project there are a lot of like kind of mellow uh nostalgic mm -hmm. tunes uh sentimental basically and that doesn't really fit if the player is goofing around yeah but it fits very well if the player is just taking the environment yeah so basically uh if you're lucky it's gonna fit really well but if you're unlucky it's gonna just be an awkward mismatch yeah so it's harder to compose in a way because you can't exactly direct what the player is going to be saying at the time often yeah. okay um yeah, so also I saw that you do music and sound design, which, although they're obviously both audio, I can imagine them being quite different beasts. Um, so how does it feel to transfer between them two? How hard is it to transition between working on both of them for, say, the same project, like the Solos project? Um, uh, it's actually... It's actually oh, I can hear myself now. No, it's good. Uh, <laughs> so I much prefer to do both principles when working on a single project rather than having someone else do the sound and I do music because when I have a, when I'm in charge of the whole audio vision mm -hmm. then it tends to meld better blend better together yeah. but uh, they are definitely two different kinds of workflows and beasts and uh, sound design you don't have to uh, tap into that same emotional yeah. uh, imagination, if you will. But at the same time, uh, you, you're kind of stuck with other problems. Like um, when it comes to music, you can make up as you go along. But with sound design, it has to be grounded in some sort of reality still. OK. Uh, so I suppose those are the main big differences. OK. So when you're composing soundtracks, it's, uh, I would imagine it's a lot more to do with the emotions you're trying to evoke in the player. Um, but with sound, design, with sound design, is it a lot more about player feedback? So say in the Solus project, when you're dehydrating, you need to design sound that indicates to players that they're, you know, they need to drink something. So can you speak a bit about how that process happens? Do like the gameplay designers come to you and say, "Okay, we need a sign that players will recognize as you know dehydrating," or is that how your kind of sound design comes about? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a back and forth. And um, like one good example would be we had a, a lot of problems with play testers getting wet in the cave systems right. because they didn't realize they were standing in water. Yeah. Uh, so they, and as you know, if you get wet and cold, you, you're basically mm -hmm. uh, in that game. So, um, just adding a bit of splashing on the footsteps when you're standing in more than five centimeters of water, then the players instantly get, I'm going to get wet. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and, and this particular example came into the game quite late and we just didn't think about it before but uh, just so suddenly you you uh, realize that we're missing uh, something that we didn't know we were missing yeah okay. and sometimes it's the game designers that say hey why isn't there sound for this sometimes it could be me saying we need to add sound to this to communicate uh, what we're trying to get across basically that's good back and forth um yeah. So the Solus project is releasing in parts, more like an episodic game. Mm. Um, so as you said, as you were going through, you came up with new sounds that you needed to uh, come up with. So with that kind of episodic release, are you making more and more sound and music as you go through, or have you done most of the workload before the first part was released? Or Well, basically most of the game 
is ready and yep. we're tweaking the, the polish as we go. And of course, we're adding a bunch of things as well based on player feedback. And uh, we realized that maybe we're not communicating this part of the story well enough, then we need to push that further in the next episode and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, like today, I'm adding a bunch of sounds for some new environmental things that we didn't have in before because we un understood that we needed to have that, basically. Exactly. Uh, but uh, mo most of my work has been done before and what I'm doing now is a lot of just checking forums and uh, since we're a super small team, uh, yeah. we, we, we all put on different hats and do all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, roughly how many people are working on the Solus project at the moment? Uh, it depends really how you count, but between four and 11 people, maybe. OK. That's pretty impressive, because I would guess it was a lot more people than that you know, working on it. Um, so yeah, uh, we're obviously doing this interview a bit before, but the day this will go live is the same day part three releases on Steam for you viewers. Um, and it should uh, appear on Xbox soon after that. Um, is there anything in particular that you are excited for players to find out? Is there any hints you can give us about that episode without spoiling too much? Um, well, you can expect to uh, find out more about what the smoke uh, or moving darkness thing really is, okay. where it originates yeah. from. Yeah. Um, and also expanding a lot on the lore of uh, what happened to all the the people that lived on the island? Okay, uh, as well as opening up some some new areas as well. Uh, yeah, it, it's quite quite a big update, I think. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know how, roughly how many hours of content there's going to be in this update? Um, yeah, well, right. it's a bit, how many hours did you spend uh, on the other parts? Well, I took eleven hours, I think, to complete. <laughs> but I, I'm not the best player. I die quite a lot of hyperthermia, so <laughs> yeah. But about 11 for part one and two. OK, so maybe uh, for you, my friend, maybe five hours more. OK, good. Yeah. Okay, cool. uh, but depends on your play style, really. Like, we, we didn't imagine that people would spend this much time on each episode, yeah. which is really cool for us. But uh, like we said in the first announcement, that part one would be one to two hours. And people spent way, way more than that. Yeah. But um, it. It's quite good to see, actually, you giving out realistic um, expectations for the mm. lamp, because I see often game developers giving out like these optimistic lamps, which players don't often reach. So uh, I think people appreciate you giving honest kind of um, time estimates. So um, in the Solus project, there's the, the sort of music you're creating is quite diverse, because there's like some really intense horror stuff. There's some more like um, epic, inspirational stuff. So how do you kind of balance that and tie them into the same project, even though they're quite different types of music? So uh, I thought about the music for the game in like different, uh, the different worlds, basically. So say uh, the planet has, the planet itself has like one uh, timbre you could say. So you have this slow drony kind of things, uh, mysterious uh, drony stuff. Uh, whereas everything that's related to the culture that you're finding out about has a, a bit more of a ethnic vibe, uh, lots of gongs and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and then you have parts that are, that I'd like to call like player themes, mm -hmm. which is uh, like story music uh, that mostly music where you have strings and piano. So yeah. more communicating what the, the player or the person that landed on the planet would be feeling, like yeah. desolation and uh, stuff like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh yeah, so is there any uh, any point in the development of the Solus project that you can point to as being your kind of favorite uh, creative moment? Or are there any areas in particular that have been hard to overcome? Um, my favorite part or any hard parts was that a question? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
just any moments that stand out as particularly challenging or fun to have worked on? Well, uh, the whole project has been quite challenging because uh, it's been a lot of work and quite, like we've been at it for quite some time, but it's always been a bit stressful because um, I had other stuff to work on as well. But I think uh, my, my favorite part is just getting into Unreal Engine because I hadn't worked in that before. Um, and uh, learning uh, to do blueprint scripting. Yeah. So uh, basically designing uh, audio systems for uh, how stuff would play out. And I suppose one of my favorite uh, things is uh, this uh, like procedural uh, ambience thing, uh -huh. which you will see in the next episode, I think, which... Uh, in that particular cave system will spawn sounds all around you. Uh, and depending on how far away it is, it picks from a different pool of sounds and it just makes the whole place feel really alive. Okay. So whereas in, in the previous cave systems, you would have more like randomized things playing around you yeah. uh, to just set the mood. But uh, for this cave system, it's very tangible where each sound is happening and it sounds like the whole place is moving and creaking and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. that that's very cool. And the biggest challenge would be just, because we didn't use any audio middleware for the game. So uh -huh. it's, it's all native uh, Unreal Engine uh, sound tools and they are very lacking at best. So that's been a huge challenge. Uh, and each little change means I have to export out new versions of the sound files and import them and yeah. big time sync. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I've been working a bit in Unreal myself for like a college project, so I've been learning a bit of blueprints and stuff. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's a lot of fun making the assets you need to put in game, but actually gelling them together and putting them in game, that's a moment I really enjoy during um, the process myself because you can see actually being part of the game, this thing you know you had an idea with. It, mm actually realizing that idea. So um, yeah, I can see why that was a highlight. Um, yeah, so could we speak a bit about previous uh, Solus Project episodes and um, see if there's anything we can kind of uh, <laughs> sure. say about the story? Because um, for the viewers, this, probably this part of the interview probably will spoil episodes one and two. Um, so there's your warning. But, um, yeah, just whose idea was it for the baby things? Because they were creepy as hell. <laughs> they are very creepy. Uh, I don't think any decision was ever made. Like, w we just opened up the editor one day and there was a room full of babies. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's a bug that turned into a feature. No, but uh, that's probably, like, most of the cool shit, it's, uh, it's Shirt's vision and his... Yeah. Awesome ideas. So okay. uh, I'm going to chalk that up to him as well. But I'm not sure who modeled the dolls or who okay. put that in there. But it, it, it's a super nice, nice moment. Yeah. Um, the uh, how how do you balance the horror aspects with the exploration? Because I don't know about other players, but I found myself exploring more to begin with when I was less scared. But as yeah. a area, I kind of went straight through a bit more because I wanted to get out the caves and I felt really relief when I got to the surface and that shows how good the horror element was mm. uh, the episodes released so far but how do you balance that with exploration like how, how, how do you still try and get the player to explore despite being scared yeah it, it's a super hard balance because uh, when we released part one and there were really no horror things happening yet uh, people would like find the ladder and go down the ladder and like, oh, it's it's like a big alien complex here. I'm just gonna go sleep for for a few hours, which is just super, like a super weird thing to do. Uh, but I don't think they would have done that if the horror element would be present at the start. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. The whole game kind of shifts as soon as that stuff starts happening. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, we amp up like the story as well, so people get more invested into that and wants to progress just to see what happens. 
Yeah. And then they sort of, we've seen a lot of streamers, they stop caring about survival. Yeah. Yeah. So they would just do really bad stuff like uh, swim in the middle of the night on the island because they wanted to get to the next part and then they would uh, complain about dying. Uh, right. yeah. But at, at the first beach, they would never do that. Yeah. So it's been super hard to balance uh, to, to keep them invested in the survival as aspect as well as uh, cons restraining their urge to explore and stuff yeah. like that. But we got a lot of complaints about the uh, people who wanted to explore the, the monastery in uh, part two mm -hmm. uh, more in depth, but they were too afraid because the, yeah. the smoke thing would always come crawling. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so the it, it was quite slow paced, wasn't it? Because like you obviously, as you said, you introduce the survival elements in Teach by um while they feel relatively safe and then kind of introduce the story stuff. So I kind of found myself uh, finding the gameplay mechanics interesting to start with, and then kind of I kept on playing mostly because of the storyline, and I'm interested to find out what um, happens to the people there, what the fireball, you know, mm. um, what that is. Um, so yeah, it's it. How how hard is it to design music based on gameplay, and also to design? based on story, because obviously the gameplay and story gel together, so the emotion that you um, bring out in players is kind of linked to both of them elements, but um, is it more like, you know, we, we need a soundtrack for when a meteorite shower happens, or do we need a soundtrack for this creepy moment where you first see the alien move and stuff like that? How um, is that the kind of brief that the other developers give you, and then you work on that, or...? Yeah, basically, so so let, let's take the Moving Darkness, for instance. Uh, it has a specific dynamic music track when you get close to it. Um, okay. But the first time you encounter it, you didn't feel particularly scare, scared when you walked through the, uh, the doors that were slowly opening. Uh, so uh, uh, Sherd said to me that we need to add another piece of music just for this moment leading up to the smoke monster. Yeah. Uh, and that helps a lot for, for, for the tension. Yeah. But at the same time, since you can't direct the player too much, people would start hearing this slow build up and then they would nope out. And then they sort of uh, destroy the, the arch of, of uh, the, the tension because you're sort of supposed to go straight for it to reach a climax, but then people would just like run away and it would tone down and it would go back and forth. Um, so the best players from a like story and musical standpoint would, would just follow along mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, do strange things. But uh, yeah, you can't really guide them too much either. Yeah. yeah. Um, it must be difficult because you kind of, I imagine you want the players to have enough freedom to feel like they're doing what they want to, but also you yeah. want to come along so that, you know, um, your story, your music is effective. Um, so uh, looking at your portfolio, it looks like most of the stuff you've done music or sound design for is kind of sci-fi um, based. Is that true? Uh, I suppose it is. Uh, I it's, it's not a conscious decision it just happened uh, but I'm yeah I'm, I'm super into sci-fi uh, and you have a ton of creative freedom when you're working with sci-fi stuff as well because uh, it, it could be anything really um, <coughs> unfortunately when I started Solus I was hoping there would be more futuristic sci-fi because yeah. that's super fun to sound design for but uh, we went uh, the uh, old world tomb yeah. <laughs> sound, sound design is dead, yeah. So lots okay. of years and stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the uh, on your website, it says you're also the audio lead for the Solos project. Um, what exactly does that entail? So obviously composing music, uh, designing sound. So did you also look over, say, the voice acting? or? Uh, yes and no. So the voice actor for the protagonist is... Uh, a good friend of uh, the writer 
mm -hmm. of the project. Um, but uh, like I said, we, we put on many hats, but uh, I'm rustling up some voice talent as well. And like, uh, since, since we had no, we didn't have really have a development budget for this game, we're just making it uh, out of our own time and pocket. Uh, so the PDA, for instance, that's my fiance talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a bunch of stuff with her. And uh, she also does the uh, uh, transmissions that you get from the Prolos command ships. But we kind of need to redo them with proper voice talent later on. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a bit of everything. Uh, but in regards to that particular title that I be there myself, it's mainly because I recently joined Teotl Studios, like instead of a freelancer, I'm now a partner of the, the studio. So that would, was the most appropriate title. Okay. Yeah. Um, does that mean that you're hoping to work on future projects that the studio are? Yeah, we already started talking about making uh, Solus Project 2. Okay. Um, got some really cool ideas for that. But it sort of depends on how well we sell. Yeah. So, Right now, we're not doing particularly well. Like, we're not doing bad sales-wise, but we're doing not at all as good as we were hoping. Okay. Uh, so uh, at first, we need to break even for the time and money spent doing the project to begin with. And after that, we can see how much we have left for a potential sequel. Okay. But it would be real super nice to, to make a, a sequel to it. Yeah, I would definitely be playing that. I'm sure a lot of people that will. So uh, mm. I hope that goes well. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of pros and cons of indie development rather than being a you know a more um, stable, perhaps AAA developer. But um, you, you said you're wearing a lot of hats. So a lot of people on the team, uh, you know, like you said, you're doing your own voice acting, you're doing your own music and stuff like that. So do you end up having more creative control on the project on the whole, do you think, than you would if you're working as a AAA developer? Yeah, definitely, um, which is just really nice. That's why I particularly enjoy working with indies, because mm -hmm. they sort of trust my judgment a bit more, I think, than uh, a huge company would. Uh, I haven't worked on AAA yet, but uh, I've been doing a lot of like contract work for uh, ads and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, you're much more constrained when working with big big companies, basically, than than with small. Uh, but it all depends on the kind of developer you're working with as well. Some of them really wants to micromanage uh, everything and have a lot of opinion on uh, the stuff that you're making, and some sort of trust your instincts a bit more, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're a, a AAA developer, from what I, from the knowledge I have of it, you you know you can more easily be replaced with someone else because there's more people applying for the position. Um, so as um, as an indie developer, you said financially it's not particularly stable, but do you do you weigh the pros of indie development as heavier than the cons? Um, I what? suppose, like, uh, to be honest, I wouldn't have been able to do this full time for the past years uh, if I didn't have support from uh, my fiance and the jobs that she's doing like a, a real job, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, pay, a paying job is the term I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, because it's, it's uh, you want to be working on passion projects and you want to do all these things. But and then at the end of the day, if you can't pay your bills, it's going to be a very time for you. So yeah. um, I think self-publishing is much better and fun and everything, but uh, you need to survive as well. Yeah, exactly. It, so it's... Game, game development is a survival game in itself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a quote. That's going to go in the highlights. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a, it sounds like a tough balance between following your passion and, you know, uh, living on a decent wage. So, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so with uh, part three coming out today, as this uh, interview is released, um, obviously we're going to learn more about the story, but are there any uh, gameplay updates, or are you adding the female character in this update, or what else can we expect to see? So we don't have a lot of days left to put in updates. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, for this update, we won't have the female voice yet. Um, the reason why we're holding off on that for a bit is because we don't know what kind of voice talent we can afford to bring in. Yeah. Like obviously, uh, if we had made much more dollar dollars, then we would uh, hire someone super professional. But yeah. now we might look like someone more uh, new in the field, I suppose. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but there are lots of bug fixes and gameplay updates in terms of, like, I think the inventory will be updated a bit. Um, I think the ladders will be addressed because a lot of people keeps, <laughs> keep falling off the ladders. Uh, uh, small stuff like that, but uh, apart from that, there's no big gameplay changers, I think. Uh, survival is going to get a bit harder okay. at some points. Um, well, like any other game, uh, the further you come along, the more complex it sort of gets, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't uh, say it's a, it's a walk in the park or something like that. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure if we, uh, we're we still like sketching up ideas for new uh, weather events and stuff like that, uh, cool stuff to put in. Not sure if any of those will make it into this update. But uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, mostly a lot of cool story stuff and uh, content, yeah. Nice, OK. Um, have you announced so far how many uh, episodes it's going to be? in this uh, series of the Skullers Project, or is that something you're going to kind of decide as you go along a bit further? So uh, it, I think it's either going, going to be four episodes and then the final release, which will be the full game release and the game finale. Yeah. Uh, so I, I suppose five episodes total, yeah. or we might uh, chop off chop up uh, the final episode into two episodes, uh, depending on uh, how we want to do with the early access uh, episodes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so between five and six, but uh, it's going to be the same length, even if it's five or six. Yeah, OK. So um, would you be able to talk a bit about the uh, advantages of releasing a game in early access or the Xbox Game Preview program? Because um, from what I can tell, it's giving you a chance to improve upon certain elements, um, take on take on more criticisms your fans um, had of the game. So uh, does that also allow you to get more marketing out there? Because with each release, you kind of get to uh, get your work out there a bit more? Or it, basically, if you're doing another project, do you think you would go through the same process with early access? Uh, I don't know. Like, like you said, it it could have been an opportunity, or it might still be an opportunity to get more press because you're doing huge releases every few weeks. But uh, mostly, it's just uh, like news aggregators that just uh, retweets the press release, and nothing much more happens for each release, media-wise. Um, but I think one of the benefits is, of course, to be able to. Uh, iterate upon stuff that you thought would work, but the players didn't really understand or didn't yeah. enjoy or stuff like that. Uh, so, so that that is a huge bonus with the early access uh, thing, uh, at least as we're doing it, like a polish round. Mm -hmm. um, and the game preview program, like originally, we did not plan to do early access, but when Microsoft approached us and asked us if we were interested in doing the preview program, we kind of felt it was a good opportunity uh, and thus decided to do early access on Steam as well. Okay. Um, and I, I think for Xbox, it's a good move because uh, as far as I know, there aren't too many titles on the preview program. I don't think so. No, there's only, I think it's three or four now, not too yeah. many. 
Uh, and, and that type of scarcity is, is kind of good in a very saturated uh, games environment. Exactly. So you kind of have your own section on the Xbox store, which is really yeah. cool. Okay. Um, but at the same time, um, a lot of people have been burned by early access titles, and they never finish, and they stay yep. in early access for years. So uh, when we announced early access for PC, a lot of people were like, oh, get another survival early access game. Yep. We don't give a you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the game I'm working on is set in the Warhammer universe. It's called Man of War Corsair, and we're releasing it in early access as well, uh, mm -hmm. April 15th. So I think from what I've seen on the Steam forums, uh, we've kind of got some similar reactions, you know, saying, are you going to be releasing basically a demo and expecting us to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Where I think a lot of developers, that's not what they're intending to do. What they're intending to do is kind of ask players if they want to invest in it early so that they can improve the thing and be part of the project. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think well, I, I can kind of see early access being better for developers, but maybe not as good for players, if that makes sense, because they don't, you know, they can't binge play it. But Yeah, maybe so, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, what can you say that you've learned from working on the Solus project? Uh... Treasure your loved ones. Um, no, uh, I've learned a, a ton of stuff. Uh, yeah. I'd say that Solus Project is like the biggest game project I've been doing to date. So uh, it's been super helpful for me to understand how much of the game development process works. Um, and uh, Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> it was how much you've learned. How much you've learned. Okay, like... yeah. So I, I've learned uh, sixty-nine percent. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I think I read on your website that uh, the Solus Project soundtrack is getting its own release. Is that true? Yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, where is that going to be sold? Is that going to be on iTunes or...? Yeah, i am probably put it on uh, mainly uh, Steam and okay. as a DLC and uh, Bandcamp, I think. Cool, OK. Uh, I think for a game soundtrack, the Steam store is where you would want to be uh, because fans are your demographic, of course, yeah. and uh, that's where they are they won't spend that time to find uh, the soundtrack elsewhere, I think. OK. So um, unless there's anything else you want to talk about, I think that's about all I've got for now. But, um, yeah. So a final question I had was, if you could pick any one game or film franchise that you'd like to work on, what would it be? Just one choice. Hmm. That's a hard question. Yeah, I probably couldn't answer it myself. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many. Um, hmm. I really like the Bioshock franchise. That would be cool. Um, yeah, film-wise. I'm not going to say Star Wars or anything like that. I, I, I'm not into that too much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, something very broody and depressing, probably. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, I hope your viewers have enjoyed this interview, and uh, thank you for joining me. It's been really good speaking to you. So likewise. Um, as I said, this this interview is going live uh, on the day the Solus Project Part Three releases on Steam, and it will be on Xbox next um, at some point after that. Hopefully, not too long. But um, yeah, that's where you can hear. Um, this great person's music, so and sound design. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> sounds like you're working hard. So yeah, thank you again for taking the time to do this interview, and um, I'm sure our readers will enjoy it. So thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Bye. And thank you all for watching. Bye bye. Take care.